Hi, everyone. Welcome to the timingresearch.com crowd forecast news, episode number 264 for May 18th, 2020. We are recording this at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And my name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of timingresearch.com. And today, uh, today we're going to have a special episode. Uh, it's um, a panel discussion with all uh, presenters that are going to be on the Synergy of Traders event this week. It starts tomorrow. So this will be the 13th of the series that uh, Anka Metcalf and I have put together. And we're going to actually be doing uh, 30 presentations over three days. So uh, tomorrow will be all about stocks and options trading. Wednesday will be about Forex. And Thursday will be about futures. So all the, um, all the panelists on today's show will be uh, We'll be doing presentations this week, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, first, we're going to get into the show, and uh, uh, I have Jim Kenny back to Monterey, the option professor, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Okay, thanks, David, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's an exciting uh, start to the week. Uh, the big story, really, is uh, the uh, uh, movement in some of the laggards. Uh, we see the S&P and the uh, NASDAQ are up uh, sharply, uh, but we also see things like transports, financials, and uh, small caps really outdoing the uh, tech today. So the catch-up trade is really on for this week so far. Uh, we have a great week ahead of us with all the presentations that are going to be happening, and we're lucky enough to have the presenters here with us today. So without further ado, uh, we're going to go around the horn and have everybody introduce our, uh, themselves. Uh, we're going to start out with somebody you should be familiar with because she has spoke before you many, many times, and that's Anka Metcalf of TradeOutLoud.com. Uh, good morning, Anka. Could you give a quick background to the new Newcomers and a little background on what uh, Trade Out Loud is up to. Good morning, Jim, and uh, hello, everyone. And I guess, Jim, it's still good morning to you, but it's 1 p.m. Eastern here on the East Coast. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right. So, hello, everyone. My name is Anka Metcalf. Uh, for those of you that do not know me, I'm the CEO and founder of TradeOutLoud.com. I have been a professional independent trader. Uh, for the last 17 years, my focus is swing trading equities and day trading futures just in the first two hours of the trading uh, session, and I'm focused on high velocity moves. Uh, former to be, uh, prior to becoming a professional independent trader, I come with 10 plus years in investment banking, and I'm the designer of an uh, institutional proprietary trading system that is based on seven layers of price support resistance, specific trigger time throughout the trading session. Uh, and uh, also specific price zones and also chart synchronicity and divergency. Uh, this is it. Um, and uh, I also have published a, a, a lot of articles with Benzinga, Yahoo Finance, Stock and Commodities Magazines, Your Trading Sedge, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks, Anka. And of course, at the end of the broadcast, you can give a little bit of uh, information on what you're going to cover at, on your presentation uh, this week mm -hmm. and uh, what time it's going to be so everybody can tune in for that. Uh, next up is going to be Amelia Bordeaux of uh, Market Compass. Uh, uh, LLC.com. And Amelia, welcome to Timing Research. And uh, could you just introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about uh, Market Compass? Sure. Hi, my name is, as you said, Amelia Bordeaux. Thanks everybody for joining in and it's great to be here today. I hope everyone is safe and well. So Market Compass um, focuses on a macroeconomic approach to markets. It's kind of a very global and top-down cross-asset approach to markets. It's very relevant for the types of markets we're in right now where everything is global <laughs> and all the central banks uh, around the world are, are moving policy and taking special measures. Um, I specialize in foreign exchange. Not all of my trades are in foreign exchange, but most are foreign exchange based in the G10 and in, in, um, spot and also in futures. And so my background is I have 17 years of experience um, on Wall Street. So I started my career at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. I worked in the International Finance Division, and I worked there back during the Asia financial crisis and the Russian debt default in like 97, 98. 
Then I went to Wall Street um, at Deutsche Bank and I worked on my entire career in, on Wall Street in the global markets division, um, most of the time in um, FX trading and sales. So I was at Deutsche Bank and I was at UBS. Um, I was the head of North American strategy for UBS and I was on the commodity research board um, at UBS. And so that job allowed me to really speak. Um, I was very lucky at that job. It allowed me to speak to the largest hedge fund managers in the world and the largest um, U.S. corporates and pension fund, real money funds here across the United States and see how they trade. And then um, I was a sales and trading at a uh, Westpac bank. Um, so I can specialize in uh, Aussie and Kiwi and in Unicredit Aga. So um, that was my Wall Street experience. Wow, that's uh, quite a bit of experience and people can really take advantage of that during your broadcast or your presentation this week, Amelia. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, uh, next up is Samantha Ladoux of LadoueTrading.com. I've been to Momart, but my French is a little weak. Uh, if I <laughs> need to be corrected there, uh, please do so. But this is Samantha and let us know a little bit about yourself as well as what's going on at your company. <laughs> no worries, David. It's uh, Samantha Laduke and it's founder of LadoueTrading.com also CIO of Leduc Capital LLC, and I trade for a living. I support clients who do the same. I run a trader education service for mostly professional retail clients until about noon, and I have an institutional um, offering in the afternoon. Specifically, I am a chase, swing, and trend trader because my focus is on anticipating volatility at inflection points that move a market stock, currency, commodity, interest rates, what have you. So my emphasis is on the macro to the micro, meaning I look at a backdrop of macro, economics, fundamentals, technical, intermarket sentiment, deliver then the actual actionable trade ideas and setups. I do that live in a trading room every morning. Also have an afternoon option education and trade management class. I write a macro to micro newsletter, as well as what, uh, if you check out my website, you'll see a fishing theme. So I have fishing plans, if you will, and I'm looking for um, rotation. This is really my specialty, if you will, is looking for volatility that enters, anticipating it. Um, and to do that also in uh, defined trade setups with a platform that I built, um, which hooks into a brokerage triggered trade alert system. So it's literally uh, fills are coming from IB, interactive broker, and triggered that particular entry and exit to my clients. Whoa, speaking of which, I'm going to just close that right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's live trading. So sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Samantha. And again, at the end of the broadcast, you can let everybody know what you're going to cover this week at your uh, presentation. Oh, it's um, going to be, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, next up is uh, Tim Merced of uh, eminimine.com. Hey, Tim, uh, could you introduce yourself and a little bit more information on uh, eminimine? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Glad to be here. Um, like you said, I trade over at eminimine.com. Uh, similar to Anka, I'm primarily a uh, day trading the futures and swing trading equities and primarily focused on that first couple hours of the day. Um, very much a technical based trader uh, looking at uh, retracements, uh, breakouts, uh, very technical analysis based and um, I am also spend a lot of time outside uh, riding mountain bikes, hiking, uh, try to get away from the screen as much as possible to uh, kind of balance out that focus uh, that you need in the morning. Sounds great. All right, guys, we're going to start out with the uh, tough questions now. We uh, have got uh, the first one is on the S&P 500. And the question is, is from today's opening to Friday's close, do you feel like the market will be higher or lower? And uh, just to use today's opening, it was a 29.13. So the uh, ups have got a 40 point head start here. Uh, starting out with Anka. Anka, what do you think we're gonna do between now and Friday? Um, we're gonna go up. Uh, we have uh, an inside uh, candle on the monthly bar that we're just triggering. Uh, we have uh, the prior month's high, so the April candle high 
29.54.86 in the S&P, and we're already trading at 29.57. So the projection is higher, at least for a first target into uh, 30.33. Okay, and uh, we'll get into your uh, percentages and what's behind it in a second. Uh, next one, uh, Amelia, how do you feel between now and Friday? I would say um, higher on the week, and I'm not a technical analyst, so I, I trade like big directional moves and yeah. that are macro based. Right. But um, this all depends on, on the news flow, right? That's the only thing that's driving the markets today, like um, the Moderna vaccine um, positive stories out today, you know, are, are boosting the market higher. So March was really about everything being shut in the US and obviously right. equities tanking. April was about the hope that things would reopen. We got past the shutdowns, if you will. And now May, we're starting to see um, things in the United States reopen like we are here in Florida and the possible difficulties that are coming with it. So we're chopping around here in the May equity markets. And I think it's very, headline driven news. And so this week um, in particular, although we don't have much of the week to go on, you know, we have very positive news of things continuing to reopen, say here in Florida, things opening across the United States and how it's being managed. And, um, you know, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed saying um, he will basically do whatever it takes to support both the economies and, you know, the fully functioning of, of U.S. markets. So that's boosting um, equity. So we have a lot of positive sentiment for, you know, equities this week. Yeah. Uh, with regards to uh, Samantha, uh, what's your feeling between now and Friday on the S&P? I'm in large part watching the oil markets. I know that is a little bit um, different than consensus, but I think we trade up into tomorrow, which was my thesis coming into the week for clients. The front month June futures contract still has some delivery issues, if you will, for those who are trading um, crude. And why that matters is this particular pop that we have right now in yields and a little bit inflation expectations and the energy move higher is in large part short covering. So I like this squeeze that's going on. There were, uh, with the May expiry, many, many, many that were obviously taken out with our negative oil print. Um, and they were expecting the same to happen with the June contract. Well, it expires today, uh, excuse me, tomorrow. And this time there are shorts to squeeze because so many came in to, you know, um, expect the same type of options expiration that resulted in a historic negative print um, in the oil markets in May. Well, they were wrong and it actually has set up for a short squeeze. So I was bullish coming into Tuesday, which is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Then I think we're going to continue to do this chop, which we have basically been above the 10 week. So from a swing standpoint, I am looking at the fact that we have literally been for one, two, three, four, five weeks and then starting out very strong today, um, back up into the high of potentially 29.55 where we had that print, if you recall, back on Wednesday, April 29th. So yes, we have the 200 day right above at 300. Um, the fact that we have this little bit of value rotation right now from momentum is largely caused by a pop in yields and energy. You saw the 10% print higher in crude this morning. I think that's gonna be unwound by tomorrow and then we're gonna come back down. So yeah, range bound as it relates to the market, because mm -hmm. until we get up and stay above this, you know, level of 29.56, right. I think we're just going to chop sideways. Yeah, you make a good point because on Friday we broke 2,800 on the S&P, which I think a lot of people were thinking was going to break down. So they could have instigated shorts on Friday. And then over the weekend, this news was so positive uh, that all those people that got caught short under 2,800 on the S&P uh, could be obviously getting seriously squeezed today. And turnaround Tuesday sometimes has merit too. So yep. you make some, you're making some interesting points. Um, next up is going to be uh, Tim. And Tim, uh, give us a little uh, update on uh, what you're seeing as far as uh, between now and Friday. Yeah, I think we can get to uh, 3,000 on the uh, S&P. And um, similar to Samantha, I think that some of this chop will certainly continue if you're, um, you know, whether you're a technical trader or a big picture, a fundamental trader, there's just a lot of factors in play. So until we can 
either break down significantly below something like that 2800 level or break up significantly like well beyond 3000 i think we'll see the range bound action continue for the week okay all right let's start to go to uh, the percentage confidence and also uh what's behind your answer as far as uh, what do you think is going to be happening this week uh, that could justify your opinion. So we're going to start out with uh, Anka. Anka, you were thinking it might be higher between now and Friday. Uh, what's your percentage confidence? And again, what are some of the ideas behind it? Okay, the technicals are very strong, and uh, this is uh, definitely uh, a very technical market. So I rely 100% on technicals for this move. And uh, I think that 75 to 80% to the upside, we're going to close very strong. And I'm, I'm agreeing with Tim. I, we could probably see 3,000. 3,000 to me would be the chop around zone, and that would be the next resistance into the 3,000 zone around that area. And if we break above that, I have no doubt in my mind that we're going to go 3,200 uh, 3, and back to the highs. Uh, the market is really anticipating – uh, this rally is really anticipating the opening up of the uh, of the economy. Yeah, there's no doubt. The housing stocks that I own, Pulte and Lennar, are going nuts here today. And so that's just another little bit of evidence that people think, uh, you yeah, know, we're going to go back to a little bit more normal pretty fast here. Exactly. Um, and, and the other thing is that we don't have a lot of economic releases. We have... Right. Uh, Federal Chair Powell da is going to testify tomorrow, and mm -hmm. we also have the FOMC meeting minutes. Uh, traders are going to try to read between the lines to see if there is anything that was omitted at the meeting that was not communicated or, you know, the rephrasing. Um, then again, the unemployment claims is not going to be a big issue. And I wouldn't even focus on unemployment claims and uh, job numbers because this is under the COVID-19, under quarantine. So it's obvious people are staying home. Nobody, I mean, unless you're an essential worker, you know, you're know, you pretty much staying at home. Right. Uh, it is going to be interesting to see a couple of months from now how the numbers are going to come out. But in the meantime, I see the market higher. A range is a range. You're, see, you're showing it here on the screen and a breakout is a Break out as easy as it gets. Yeah. Seems like people are going out to eat. Uh, neighbors go out to Fleming's for dinner the other night. And so yeah. uh, it seems like people are getting back on the horse. Um, the economy is open. And in Florida, we have the beaches open today and everything is open. Boating, restaurants, everything yeah. is open. Yeah. Gyms. Yeah. All right. Well, Amelia, uh, what's your confidence level on um, uh, higher by the end of the week? And uh, what are some of the things that you're kind of looking at right now as far as uh, reasons behind your opinion? Well, first, I have to say that I think any confidence, um, you know, is, is pretty fragile right now, at least mm -hmm. for me, simply because any headline can come out at any time. What I like about the breakout we're seeing now is um, from the high of the equity market, which is around um, the 12th of February, um, and the S&P 500, at least I'm speaking to now, um, you know, there's a 61.8% Fibonacci retracement that we just kind of broke through. Um, this morning here on the S&P 500. So that's good. You know, we broke through a resistance level and I would say 3000 is, is the next one. It's just so choppy with any news that can come out. Um, you know, Chairman Powell has spoken a lot already. He was institute, he was interviewed um, on YouTube by the Peterson Institute on Friday and he was live, uh, not live, but he had a pre-taped interview that was shown last night on 60 Minutes and you can get the transcript from that if you I put them up on my Twitter account, but um, he has denied in both interviews that the Fed is um, interested in um, going to negative rates. And that, that really helped the market. It helped support the U.S. dollar as well. And so this week in testimony, though you never know how he'll be questioned, it's unlikely he's going to so quickly change the Fed's stance on that. So that to me is positive um, for equities this week that we've heard so much from Chairman Powell over the, from Friday to Sunday night, basically. Um, and I would encourage anybody to go and watch or read on um, the transcripts of those interviews. They're very important. In terms of things opening up, I'm in North Florida. And yes, restaurants are open here in North Florida. I think it's different in different counties at 50%. And what I'm seeing um, is it's extremely slow to open, which is mm -hmm. discouraging to me, very discouraging. So restaurants here are allowed to open and some have chosen not to open. And I've, I've asked them why, or they're just open only for takeout, even though they're allowed to have people <laughs> get inside now. 
And they're telling me that to open at 25 or now 50% capacity with nearly 100% overhead costs just doesn't work for them. And so the other thing they're worried about, which is very interesting, is there's a lot of demand here in North Florida to go out to eat and people aren't afraid. Um, seemingly they are going out. But the problem is crowd control. And so the restaurants that I spoke to are telling me, like, we're worried about crowd control and we can't comply with the six feet away from the state and we don't know how to enforce it. So we are not opening until we think we can enforce it. And so that's really, really interesting for me. And so I see a lot of demand for people here in Florida to go out to restaurants where I live. And I see um, the restaurants being unable to meet, um, to both comply with the state and meet the demand. So there's a lot of challenges to opening, which are taking a long time. I've also gone retail shopping and clothes stores here, and they're not allowing people to try on clothes, which is difficult to buy them. And also, um, they haven't changed inventory. So now it's very warm here in Florida, where when we shut in March, at least in North Florida, it was like in the upper 60s, and now it's in the 90s. And we still have kind of sweaters and jeans in the stores and no summer clothes. So I don't know how they're going to clear that inventory. And so while it's exceptionally positive for the economy that things are opening, and I'm very happy about that, um, and it's a big boost to people's spirits um, here where I'm living, I think, um, it's not without challenges that are going to continue to weigh on the economy, you know, for the next couple of months, I see going forward. Yeah, you made a good point about the clothing because it's like 90% drop in clothing, uh, which is really good news for TJ Maxx. So that's uh, probably mm -hmm. one of the reasons why TJX is up about 5% here today. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, when we say everything's open, everything is starting to open here, at least in North Florida. But I can definitely see the challenges that are occurring. And I have, and I feel bad, you know, for these business owners and some of these stores. And also a lot of the big box stores where I live aren't open yet. So certainly individually or smaller boutiques are all open. And, um, but some of the big box stores have chosen not to open yet, which is interesting. Okay, Samantha, a uh, little bit of a percentage confidence on your uh, feeling that we could be uh, going higher, albeit choppy. And uh, again, uh, you mentioned some of the reasons, but could you uh, go over some of the reasons you think uh, we'll get that type of action this week? Yeah, I, uh, to clarify, I'm looking at 29.75 for SPX, and that, I believe, will get rejected. So I'm expecting only, I was only bullish into Tuesday, which is tomorrow, and then right. we pull back. I, see a, I do a lot of intermarket analysis, which is relationships that show the undercurrent, if you will, um, behind underneath the price action. And they are telling me big divergences. We have not retested the lows. I have reason to believe that the bottom is not in. Um, the chance of actually moving above 3,000 to me is highly suspect. I'm, I know we've got you know, eight and a half trillion um, between the Fed, Treasury, and Congress of liquidity, et cetera. But I'm not someone who is um, expecting this to recover all-time highs. So it's been a lovely, I love being bullish into earnings and uh, you know trading these vaccine stocks as if they're internet stocks from 2000. But I am not um, someone who is at all expecting a vaccine. So when I first you know, glommed on to this coronavirus um, uh, risk. I actually became obsessed with it. I'm, I'm a bit of a geek and a researcher. So I kind of like disappeared for basically a week um, and came up with an article on January 28th that was entitled Coronavirus, uh, Perfect Storm, Coronavirus and Market Risks. At the time, there were only 2,000 cases, you know, recorded worldwide. But the point was, this to me is not going to be fixed. We have to learn to live with it. I think these lovely um, uh, vaccine speculative stocks are a heck of a lot fun to trade, but they are not investments. Um, I believe that this is, we are going to have a sputtering, if you will, of economic, you know, activity, uh, you know, opening and closing and um, all kinds of, you know, sputtering. But I do not expect growth to expand. I expect it to contract. So with that, it's very hard to be from a you know, fundamental basis bullish from my intermarket analysis, which helped me spy this complete you know, rollover on February 18th. It still says it's not done going down. So I can definitely trade on a smaller time frame, which I'll talk about you know, tomorrow, the chase, the swing, the trend time frame. 
but um, it's not um, enough just to have price action for me um, or even you know, the headline, if you will, a vaccine, I want to see underneath what's really motivating this rotation. And for right now, yields popping is a yield, is a value play. In other words, momentum quiets mm -hmm. and the oversold value plays percolate. That whole thesis of energy, when we have commodities, when we have inflation expectations, pull up the yield which is right now up 11% on the 10 year, it pulls up commodities, which again, my thesis going into Tuesday, that we had short covering, unlike the May expiry of the futures, of the June futures, we're gonna need to unwind that and then we can go back down. Mm -hmm. So that it's another reshort for oil, it's a reshort for the market, it's whack-a-mole as far as I'm concerned. These are a beautiful potential trend reversal in value plays, meaning small caps, maybe regionals. That's why your, uh, you know, your, your home builders are doing well. So this oversold, in some cases, left for dead, like the retail, um, which has a beautiful chart, by the way. Uh, <laughs> these are definitely nice plays, but I do not believe that they are, um, that the market is safe. Right. Well, you make two good points uh, off the bat. You got the 200-day moving average at around 3,000, so that could be an impediment. And the other thing is, is the uh, virus stocks like Zoom, Teladoc, and uh, Peladon, uh, they're all getting hit pretty good here today. Well, they're not, they're not the virus stocks. So those are the work-from-home stocks. We have a new economy. Yeah. So the cloud plays are being bid up because of the, you know, the, the whole new culture of working from home, and it's not going to, you know, reverse automatically as you can mm -hmm. see from google and twitter and such going okay we're actually going to in amazon you guys are going to work from home and you know that's that's helping this my this rotation into the cloud and the tech plays but the vaccine plays are different the myrna the sorrento sereno whatever it is srne that's up like hundreds of percent this is total speculation and mm. it's going to disappoint in my opinion but they're fabulous chases for sharks who smell right. the blood and want to make some coin because they're up so much. I, I've been tracking these since February. <laughs> so it, this, is, this is what I mean by vaccine plays are separate from work from home plays. All right. Well, let's switch over to Tim. And Tim, uh, can you give us a little uh, hint on what your confidence level is on higher by the end of the week? And of course, uh, what's behind the curtain on some of the things you're thinking about? Yeah, I'll go ahead and say 70% confident that I think we can close higher in the week. Um, you know, 3,000 was the number I threw out there. One, it's, it's kind of a big round number, and, uh, and those kind of numbers lend themselves to market rallies. Um, the fact that we've broken the uh, swing high from a couple of weeks ago here in the, uh, the S&P uh, is important. Um, when the gals also mentioned the 61.8 break from the large short, um, at this point, from a larger picture perspective, you know, it feels more like we're in a, a rumor rally, if you will. Uh, we've got a lot of, you know, businesses open, opening for the COVID stuff. And it's going to take a couple of weeks for the numbers to catch up. And if uh, cases are going to spike, you know, we don't know. So for the next week or two, people are optimistic. It's springtime. They're getting outside. So while I'm primarily trading the tech, uh, those kind of factors can certainly uh, help move the market in a what might seem unrational way uh, very quickly. And when we do get some hard numbers or some results on potential vaccines, the uh, you know then you might see a bigger turnaround and uh, and sell off. But you know last week. We had a little bit of a slide on Tuesday, Wednesday, and we weren't really able to get any follow through to the downside. Mm -hmm. And so seeing the potential for momentum to be building, uh, the potential where you know we're starting to break some swing lows here on the daily chart uh, on Thursday last week, but then close positive Thursday, and then we start the week off here with a uh, strong gap up, um, really kind of weakens the case for, for shorts. Yeah. 
Well, we certainly have an order imbalance here because uh, obviously the amount of money coming in is just blowing away. And so the market, uh, people on the sell side are raising the offer as high as they can, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, to take in all this volume. The question is, is, will there be another wave of volume behind it in the short term? Or is this wave of volume going to be exhausted and then it falls a little bit under its own weight? We'll probably know that by the end of the week, too. Um, okay, well, the thing here is, is uh, there's a question that we're going to uh, put out to everybody. Um, and I think uh, it's very important, especially to the listeners here. Uh, and it goes like this. We're going to start out with Anka. Uh, what uh, procedures do you use uh, to monitor and evaluate your trading results and your progress over time? So how do you keep track and monitor um, your trading results and also your progress on your trading over time, Anka? Um, I think this is one of the most important things about trading is keeping a track record of all your trades and uh, detailed uh, track record that is. Um, ever since I can uh, remember, uh, I've held a trading journal and uh, I keep one to this very day for all of my trades. Um, I keep one for the trading room, obviously, because we day trade. Uh, in the futures trading room in the first two hours, I have uh, strategies that are designed for high velocity moves in the first two hours in the morning. And we keep a track record of all of these trades. However, if you are a trader that, you know, uh, trades for the whole trading session or even a 24 hour trader, you day trade or swing trade, I think it's very important to keep track of all your trades. Uh, so the statement at the end of uh, each month from your broker, they're not going to bring a lot of clarity into your trading. They're just going to show you how much you're up or you're down. Uh, but the reality is that with uh, this uh, trading journal, you can have details, you can add details that can uh, that you can easily self-analyze at the end of the month, at the end of each quarter, especially if you're in the beginner stage of your trading. And I think that a quarter is much more representative uh, than a month because if you have just started trading, let's say in the March of uh, in the month of March, uh, and if you let's say I don't know incur losses, then you know why those losses are right. But um, and again, you know the detailed explanations are fantastic. Knowing the time of the day where when you got into a trade, like I said, if you're a whole day trader. Uh, day trader or swing trader and lay out the explanation for each trade, what time you took the trade on. So you could see at the end of the month or at the end of the quarter, what time worked for you as a trader better than other timings uh, in the market. Um, for some traders, uh, you know, maybe the first two hours in the day is way too aggressive. Um, if you're not, you know, having a really good, if you don't have a great experience into day trading uh, rapid moves and high velocity move, moves. Um, and I think that if you're, let's say, a trend trader, you're going to see that, you know, trades lay out a little bit later in the day and uh, in certain cases, you may uh, get some re-entry opportunities like, you know, pretty much we had here into these indices today, into the futures indices. So they uh, continued uh, on to the very strong path uh, to the upside, even beyond uh, the doldrum, even within the doldrum period, because we're still trading into the doldrum period. So having detailed explanations, the time when you entered the trade, the strategy that you traded, if you stopped out of the trade, uh, how you, um, you know, how the detailed explanation on how you manage the trade, I think it's very important. Uh, and like I said, at the end of the month or the quarter, you can easily see what worked for you and what did not work for you. And also another thing that helps you improve your trading is, for instance, if you're a day trader, but it can be applied to swing trading as well. Uh, print two charts of the same uh, symbol that you've traded, whether you're trading futures or stocks or whatever it is, Forex, you name it. So print two charts on one chart, mark uh, exactly the area where you entered, where you have to stop and how you trailed and when you exited the trade. And on the second chart, just look at the, uh, look at the real uh, parameters of the trade, where you should have gotten in, where you should have placed to stop, and how you should have trailed. And this way, this is a great idea for self-analysis. It's actually you could be your own mentor. You can find out what you did wrong that day or in that specific trade. So okay. to, to me, it's 
definitely trading journaling. Sure. Keeping a journal and get an idea of which way the action is going. Mm -hmm. Okay, Amelia, you've been in the markets and around the markets for a long time and a lot of experience. So you must have something to add here as far as, uh, again, uh, what procedures to use to try to monitor and evaluate your trading results and your progress over time. Yes, thank you. So, you know, this admittedly was a lot um, easier to do, but a lot um, more stringent um, on, a, on a trading floor like UBS or, or Westpac or, or Deutsche Bank where you have legal and compliance and you have um, your risk parameters for the day as, as a trader or a sales trader. So for instance, what would happen there um, you know, we had our risk monitoring system. So if something moves as a spot trader, one stand, if the markets are just moving, they're volatile that day, the VIX is spiking and markets are moving and currencies are moving, currencies are volatile because something's happening in the markets. Um, you know, if something moves like one standard deviation over your risk parameter and you don't do anything as a spot trader, um, compliance comes at you right away. Like you're over your risk parameter. Why didn't you do something? What didn't you do? So you know um, immediately with your alert system. So I don't expect people to have alert systems like that, but I'm, what I'm doing is I'm stressing the importance of it, right? So say if somebody, which, which would happen, say at Unicredit, um, you know, would hit us in clips of say 50 million uh, euro at a clip over maybe four minutes, right? So 50 million, 50 million, 50 million, 50 million, they're averaging into a $400 million euro position over say, you know, four or five minutes. So how that would work was, would be like, they'd come at you and they would say price in 50 euro. So they're asking you for a two way price, you price them, they hit you on the right side. Um, so they're buyers and then they continue to hit you on the right side for the next day, five minutes into 400 million. So in that case, you, deal, you do the deals with them and then you book them after like, say that you book the deals as a trader after those four, after they average into 400 million and you book it at the average price, okay? So you, they are, they're clearly averaging into a, a large position. You give them the average price, they probably roll it forward, you book the trade. A second later, a second after you hit press, you know, booking the trade on the trading floor, boom, here comes an email from legal. And legal hits you with an email and that says, at that exact time you booked that trade, Amelia, you are, you know, one one hundredth of a pip under the range of the market for the day, the range of the market at that time. And they're like, explain yourself. So then what you have to do is you have to show screenshots. You have to screenshot your screen and go back each time you dealt the 50 million. And you have to say, this is exactly where it was when I dealt the 50 million. And now here is the average price because I averaged the price that the client wanted into the 400 million. So the average price is within the market range, but maybe, you know, one of the book, the deals that you booked individually wasn't. And so then some legal will say, okay, and they review it externally themselves. And then they, the trades all go through. So this is how closely, you know, you're watched on a trading floor. And so I, I agree with Anka, you should keep a trading journal and you should watch yourself very closely, um, you know, on a daily basis. So how many trades a day do you do? How many trades an hour do you do? When is the best time of trading for yourself? Like, you know, the best time for me to trade FX is right in the morning when London's open. I think the worst time to trade FX, um, if I look back at over my career, is, you know, right before Asia opens, um, you know, around 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. in the U.S. before Asia opens. I don't like the liquidity then. I don't really love the pricing then. I think I'm more apt to make a mistake or pay too much away on a trade during that time. So, um, you know, monitor the times of days you, you trade, monitor obviously every single trade. And then if a trade doesn't go well, um, you know, write in your notes or on Excel or in your journal, why, what, what went against you? Why did the trade not go well? And if a trade did go well, the same reasoning, why did it go well? What did I know going into the trade? Did I do more preparation? Did I do more homework? Was I trading an event? Um, was there an event I wasn't aware of that impacted this trade or a headline that impacted this trade? And I've also worked at two global macro hedge funds and, and hedge funds are interesting because um, for their clients, they do a very detailed monthly macro note on exactly 
what happened, you know, they give the results of the, of the portfolio and they also, you know, tell you what they're looking at ahead. But it's a very detailed analysis of why they did what they did and if it worked or if it didn't work. And, you know, the hedge fund clients are very sophisticated. So um, they, they demand a high level of analysis as to what was traded and why and when. And so I, I think you should always ask that of yourselves. And, and as you take notes on the, you know, on the trading floor, all the spot and execution traders would do this um, at the big banks at least, you know, we take notes in an Excel spreadsheet on what was happening that day, especially in, we are seeing outstanding markets right now, you know, in terms of unprecedented what's happening around the globe. And so, you know, take notes on this time of everything you trade and, and what's happening even cross assets and what are the headlines that day? Because I guarantee you sometime in your career, maybe six months from now, maybe unfortunately there's gonna be a second round of shutdowns um, due to virus coming back in the winter time. We all hope not, but maybe that's, it's possible that that's gonna be the case. And if it is, you want to have all your notes from the first shutdown time as to who shut when, how it impacted the market, what did oil do, what did the 10-year bond yield do, what did the dollar do, what did the yen do, you know, and you can go back and refer to those notes, and I call those notes deja vu, you know, when you sit and you watch tick by tick every single day, whatever market you're in, and you watch them all day, every day, um, you start to recognize patterns when certain headlines come out, and just on your own, you say, you know what, it's so I've seen this before. This reminds me of this time back in March 2020 when uh, California announced overnight that it was shutting immediately. This, this, this reminds me of the market that day. And so go back and look at the notes on that day, what happened, and you know, you'll be more prepared for um, the trading day going forward if something reminds you of it. And I call those my deja my deja vu notes. And then, you know, obviously as Anka, you know, went through, I keep a spreadsheet of every single trade and what performed and what didn't. And I also note my mental mindset. Like, was I nervous about this trade? Was I really confident about this trade going into it? Did I hang on to it too long because I was like, emotionally attached to the, the idea of the trade? Um, did I obey my stops? Did I have too tight a stop and it took me out? You know, I, I work with a client, this is really interesting. I work with a client on a huge dollar yen trade. Um, this was like five years ago. They were at a hedge fund and they were, I, I don't remember, I think they were like long dollar yen and they, they thought like, they had all these reasons why dollar yen would go higher. And um, it was a huge trade for them. And they were correct in their view, but their timing was wrong. And so what literally happened was they had had this trade on with the bank for like months. Like it is going to break really high. It is going to go. We have all these reasons why. And all the reasons ended up being correct, but the timing was wrong. They literally took the trade off. They were like, they gave up. They got, they got stopped out and re-entered, stopped out and re-entered. They gave up. And then like literally 48 hours later, dollar yen flew in the direction that they had been predicting for like three months. And so that's really, really tough. And so those are the times that you have to look at yourself and say, you know, I loved my idea so much, but I was just too early into it. I was just too excited about it, got in too early and, um, you know, totally got taken out of the trade two days before it worked. And so, you know, you have to keep track of those times. You have to temper your excitement about a trade, you know, and you have to, you know, really question all of your, all of your trading, you know, instincts. And so I think yeah. by keeping these detailed spreadsheets and journals, um, it's really, really important. Yeah. I think the two things you say is, you know, you have the numerical um, ledger on uh, plus or minus, but then you also have the circumstances involved and other factors. And so then you can kind of follow, you know, what was going on and what occurred during that time frame, And then of course, compare it to the result and maybe over time, you could see the ones that are winning. Uh, what was your temperament and circumstances involved? And yeah. then obviously try to emulate uh, the circumstances that were positive. And if you see the other circumstances happening, you can remember that those were uh, losing environments. So maybe you could, uh, you know, tailor your behavior uh, by just looking at the journal as well as the circumstances connecting with every trade. Yeah, it's really important. As yeah. I said, all of the hedge funds do this. They put out really detailed letters on the ledger, 
the market circumstances, the mindset of the firm. That's great. Okay, uh, next up, um, we're going to uh, find out what Samantha does to try to, again, uh, monitor and evaluate uh, the trading results as well as the progress over time. So the short run, the result, and over the longer term, uh, what is the progress over time? Well, thank you. First, I am sitting in front of the computer every day and I'm live commentating by you know, scanning and synthesizing market moving news. So I couldn't record all of that and really have it be meaningful. <laughs> it's too much, um, uh, too much action, but I do write a you know a client post every day, but it's not regurgitating what happened. It's what I see from context of the data from the market moving news um, after commentating the live trading room. So I'm in essence creating um, a macro backdrop and then the technical levels by being you know alert and watching um, for price you know action and volatility every single day and then writing that up for clients is creating, if you will, well, I call it a fishing plan, but it's like a trading journal. And then the ideas when they're captured, and this is across stock options, futures are based on, you know, technical entries and price targets, both for stop loss and profit. And it's very kind of straightforward. There's a trading journal that's on um, online across multiple books. So it's the position size, the tactics, stock or option, what have you, the underlying entry price, uh, the underlying stop loss of the stock, even though I'm an options trader. So I like to use that also as um, an OCO type of order. In other words, using the underlying um, asset as a stop loss for my option. And basically this is, you know, recorded, date entered, date exited, entry price and, you know, and exit price and percentage sold. And anyway, so I have that already built in and it's brokerage triggers. So what I'm more, excuse me, more focused on is the themes, like what justifies taking trades, macro or micro? Is it a chase in a vaccine that's speculative? Is it like my, you know, oil higher theme, um, you know, into Tuesday? You know, what do I really see happening with um, yields and that play, if you will, into the value rotation in small caps and energy and home builders and, you know, regional banks, which are big weighting in IWM. So that for me is intermarket analysis and macro analysis, putting it together into a client post, which then creates the, the, these, the whole theme <laughs> of what to trade. Um, and then the trading room is how to trade it. And, you know, this trade alert, if you will, of identifying entry, exit, and of course the envelope of stop and profit is live trading journal. So I'm, for me, looking at the biggest uh, thing over time is return on investment. I'm, I'm an options trader, so I want to use as little as possible for dollars into an actual trade. I like um, directional calls for sure, because I'm a volatility trader, but I also like the spread. If I don't see volatility, but a smooth direction, I'm not going to have as big a return in that particular case, but I'm also not going to potentially lose as much if I'm wrong on a directional um, option uh, play. Financed call spreads, a little bit more advanced, but they're really something I can set and forget and put it further out in time. And time for me falls into three time frames. The chase is something that is typically one to three days, you know, expecting a move. Um, and it, it employs options one to three weeks out. I'll talk about this tomorrow in the, in the presentation. Uh, swing trades, one to three weeks, employing options one to three months out. And trend trades, they typically last one to three months and they employ options three to six months out. So for me, I want to have return on investment be the, what I'm most proud of if you will. And then the most important reason I trade options is I don't risk anything more than I'm willing to lose because they're defined risk. So I can position size um, according to how much I know I'm exposed. So for me, that is also indicative of good risk management is the return on investment. Sure. 
Okay, well, that's fantastic. And uh, right now we're going to let Tim uh, give a little insight on to, uh, again, uh, what procedures did you use <clears throat> to monitor and evaluate your trading results and also the progress over time? What do you think, Tim? Yeah, so the three main equations, if you will, that I look at um, when analyzing trades, as uh, the ladies have said with uh, the trading journal, uh, the three things that I look at most importantly are the expectancy, the R multiple, and then I pay attention to you know my max drawdown over a period. So uh, expectancy is really just looking at what's my average trade. So if I've got 100 trades from the past couple of months, you know, I can look at, okay, what is the average trade uh, that I've made, the size of that trade, taking into account winners and losers. Um, and that's really helpful. Well, all of these are helpful to give you, you know, a baseline. And so if you find that on average, you're, you know, you're making $250 on a trade when you factor in winners and losers, and then all of a sudden the markets get extra volatile and uh, now you're making $500 on a trade, you know, that can, um, can help give you some indications on whether or not things are uh, moving forward or moving backwards. So let's say you go into a period where all of a sudden you're only making $100 on average, or you start to see your average expectancy, your average trade start to decline. That can show, okay, maybe, um, you know, I'm going through a rough patch or the market conditions just aren't so great at the moment. And by having that baseline, it can kind of help you just keep an eye on your progress over time. If you've got five years of trading results in a trade log and you calculate your average trade, one or two trades isn't even going to move the needle. 10 or 20 trades might not even move the needle. So it can help keep you um, almost like if you're, you know, steering a ship heading generally towards the horizon, you might make some small course corrections with the, uh, with the steering wheel. But um, in general, you're kind of heading towards, uh, towards your, your horizon. Uh, the R multiple is just a, a ratio of the uh, gain to risk. So if you risk, $100 on a trade and you make $200, you have a two to one uh, reward to risk. And again, that's a really good way to determine taking in all the factors of the number of winning trades, the average winner, the average loser, all of those different variables. At the end of the day, I want to know, you know, how much reward did I make for what I risked? And if um, I find that my R multiple is starting to decline or my R multiple is starting to increase, that can again help me determine, okay, am I uh, better than my average? Am I moving ahead or am I starting to take a step back or, or uh, decline? And then the drawdown is uh, pretty straightforward. You know, what was the, the biggest losing period that I saw over, you know, obviously the bigger time frame, the better. But that can be a really helpful way to uh, keep things in check, especially when it comes to uh, confidence through tough times. You know, if you know that over the past couple of years, you've had a few periods that you were down X amount, and then you came out the other side just fine. Well, if you start to go through a little bit of a rough patch, you can look to that max drawdown and say, okay, well, you know, I'm about 50% towards the, the worst drawdown that I've ever had. So I really don't need to panic, don't need to jump ship or change my strategy or completely uh, change things up. I can just kind of stay the course. And so those three things, the uh, expectancy, arm multiple and max drawdown, I find are really helpful ways to analyze uh, your trade data. Okay, thank you, Tim. Now, uh, again, the two things that have impressed me this morning, uh, and I've been doing this for decades, is uh, how knowledgeable our speakers are, and also how diverse their approaches are, which I think is just fantastic for the investors who are able to go to these presentations this week. So I would like to, uh, again, uh, thank, uh, thank 
the speakers that are here with us, we also have other speakers in addition, but the speakers that you heard this morning are clearly very, very knowledgeable. And I think they have some very unique approaches to how to work with the markets. Um, the second thing that impresses me is how uh, they are going to be willing to share this knowledge with all the investors that are listening and all that will tune into the presentations. I just think that uh, it's just outstanding because, um, you know, some of these people have gone through a, an awful lot of things in order to uh, get to the conclusion they are now with, the, with their uh, knowledge and to share them with everybody this week, I just think is a, a fantastic opportunity. So what I'd like to do now is just have uh, David Cosmeter come on and uh, make sure that everyone knows exactly the day and the time that each one of the uh, presenters will be uh, doing their presentation so that you don't miss it and you can write it down and then basically, um, you know, make sure you, um, make sure you get there. Uh, before I leave, I'd just like to thank Anka, Amelia, Samantha, and Tim for being here today. I've really enjoyed it, and I think uh, the investors should really take advantage of these uh, presentations this week. Right now, I'm just going to turn it back over to David, who can help us out with uh, the date and the time of the presentations. We can, we can have everyone do a quick uh, uh, a synopsis of uh, what they're going to talk about this oh, week, okay. uh, if you want to do. Um, sure, so sure, sure. Well, let's, want to start uh, let's with uh, Anka? Okay. All right. Uh, so tomorrow I will be speaking for the first time in a very long time about my swing trades, uh, and that is into stocks. So I'm going to be talking about how to swing trade in profits, trading only 10 minutes a day, uh, trading stocks and ETFs. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so Anka will be talking tomorrow on Tuesday at 6 um, p.m. Eastern time? Yes. Um, and... and Yes, and on, on futures. Thursday, yeah, on Thursday, uh, we're going to talk about day trading futures, how to day trade futures in the first two hours of the trading session, New York trading session. All right. Thank you, Anka. Okay. And uh, Amelia, what, uh, what are you planning on talking about? Hey, I am speaking, yes, Wednesday, May 20th at noontime, Eastern Standard Time. And um, I will be speaking about um, event risk and macro themes, um, how to manage event risk, why um, it's important to know event risk, and why it's important to follow, to identify macro themes and follow the development of macro themes as it primarily relates to foreign exchange futures trading and FX trading. But if you are a technical trader only and you are not a macro trader, um, this is important for you too because it will help you um, help to manage volatility and help to realize which days potentially could be more volatile than others. And those vol more volatile days are probably the days your technical levels you're watching um, have the best chance of, of breaking. So um, this is kind of um, a little seminar um, on a larger, very cross asset, more in depth one that I do for clients. Um, that's my global macro event risk webinar, which is monthly. And um, you can find that on my website as well, www.marketcompassllc.com. If you go to the webinar tab, um, there's a whole video and um, it tells you more about it. But I'll give you a little sample of it um, tomorrow at noon, on Wednesday at noon. And I think it'll really um, help give you some insight into what I do and, and how it can help your trading. All right, sounds great. And Samantha, you'll be tomorrow yeah. at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. I'm gonna be talking about time frame congruence, which is just a fancy way of saying that uh, patterns emerge on multiple time frames. For some, they are day traders. You know, they're looking at a two hour window uh, versus two days in a trade, two weeks, two months. What I'm doing is I'm actually putting, you know, different charts side by side to show the power, if you will, of moving from the inside out and vice versa. So we can structure vol um, option um, tactics based on direction, volatility, and time. And this is why I deem it the chase, swing, and trend trading with options. And I'll show you how I do it and structuring also um, the, the strike prices, the position size, um, the liquidity, everything that I'm looking for basically in an options trade based on multiple time frames. All right, thank you. And Tim, your presentation is going to be on Thursday at 11 a.m. Yeah, I'll be speaking on Thursday talking about uh, 
the futures markets, specifically uh, the E-minis. Be looking at uh, how I use uh, retracements to uh, get in on an intraday basis. Looking at the, the first couple hours of the day and uh, different ways that you can use the technical tools uh, in a simple, simple manner to uh, to day trade the ES, NQ, YM, and uh, capitalize each day. All right, sounds good. And Jim, you're going to be talking at uh, five o'clock Eastern time tomorrow. Yep. And uh, yeah, we're going to be going over uh, uh, obviously different sectors of the um, of the markets. Uh, the small caps and some of the laggards are really picking up a lot of steam. And uh, we talked about the home builders and things like that. And we're also going to go over strategies to create, to create cash flow and income. And we're also going to go over from time to time how you can use uh, different strategies like collars to protect your assets against market decline. So we've got quite a bit on the docket and uh, look forward to talking to everybody tomorrow. All right. Sounds good. And uh, yeah, just a reminder, uh, people always ask about the archives. So um, well, I'll talk about uh, how to get live access first. So you just go to timingresearch.com, click on live. It's always the easiest way to get access to the live events. So um, Tuesday through Thursday this week, uh, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern time, we'll, be, we'll have the room open live and you come, come to this page and click to get access to the live event. And then also the archives, uh, each night, uh, I'll have a separate post that will go live on, or it'll be posted to the main uh, main page of Timing Research that will have all the archives for that day. So it'll, the archives will be grouped by day, and it'll have um, you know each of the videos with the title and, uh, of the presentation and, and some info about each one. So uh, you'll be able to get access each night there. So if you miss anything, you can review. Uh, the list and, and catch up or or rewatch anything that uh, that you that you want to see again. So uh, so also uh, be sure to subscribe to Time Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast directory because I also post all the uh, recordings as uh, audio only podcasts. Uh, if you uh, so if you don't have time to watch the videos or anything that you want to catch. So all right. Uh, so that's it for today. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, hope everyone can, can join us this week. We can, uh, like I said, we're doing 30 presentations in three days, and uh, should be a lot of good in info. So thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, David. Thank you, thank you so much. Take care. Bye.